We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello? Do people hear me? <laughs> Just a little... Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, I'm not hearing you. Hello, everybody. Hi. If you can hear, you can hear me? Great, great. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. yes, good to have you, finally. Uh, the music kind of stopped. <laughs> Did we lose the uh, moderator? Okay. <laughs> Do you hear me? Yeah, everything fine? There was a breakup just now. Okay, if there is anything, just let me know, huh? because, um, yeah, uh, the connection could uh, disrupt any time. But uh, hopefully, we're all good people, so we should all be fine. And, uh, yeah, let me kindly ask all my panelists to switch their camera on so that we know who are there and... Uh, if everybody is there, I know two of our panelists would join us momentarily. So uh, we should have uh, five people on with video and I am, okay, great. I see two guests on site, great. So that's, uh, that's the right number of people. So without much ado, um, let me get things going. And a warm welcome and hello from middle of the night here in Beijing. I'm Vishin from CGTN. It's a great honor to be able to host this uh, high-level leaders track on building equitable employment conditions and competences for the future of work as part of the 16th annual Internet Governance Forum that is being held in a hybrid manner from uh, Katowice, Poland. I hope I say the name correctly. I would have loved to be there, but uh, unfortunately, something is preventing us. But thank God we have good technology, and that is also part of our discussion today. So the future of work is facing changes, including a shift in demand towards ICT professionals, a move to independent, flexible, and freelance employment, a need for keeping pace with technological evolutions and a transfer of human capacities to more reflective, creative and complex tasks. A case in point for me as a TV presenter is the onslaught of AI presenters whose makeup is always perfect and never make mistakes. But how will these new technologies impact labor markets and income distribution? We don't know fully yet. What we know is that the right policy, policy mix and institutional arrangements can and are needed to help employers and potential employees to adapt and thrive. And that's an important discussion to be had. That's why we're hosting this high-level leaders track on how governments and international organizations and private sector can further and better collaborate to help adopt and diffuse new technologies while addressing their negative consequences. Our discussion will focus on policy alternatives from educational ones addressing early education, including STEM focus and constant reskilling for future employment, to ones dealing with new forms of balancing in employment relationships. The panel will reflect on policies that can help employees and society at large to manage the transition with as little disruption and as many benefits as possible. And I hope our discussion today will have as little disruption and as much usefulness as possible for all of you who are watching us either online or offline on site. Let me introduce with great pleasure the distinguished panelists we are going to have, or we already have with us. Uh, we will welcome Ms. Carmen Lejia Valderrama. She is Minister of Information Technologies and Communications from Colombia. She will join us momentarily. We, will ha we have, and I'm going to try here, Mr. Wojciech Merzik, 
Secretary of State, Ministry of Science and Education from Poland, our host country. Please correct me if I <laughs> pronounce the name not so accurately. We have, uh, we will have Mr. Thorsten Schäfer Gumbel, who is member of the management board of the Agency for International Cooperation, or GIZ, from Germany. He will join us momentarily as well. But we do have Ms. Ranalia Abdul Rahim, Senior Vice President of Strategy, Communications and Engagement of Internet Society. She's joining us online. We have Mr. Luke McKend, Head of Growth Markets and Head of Government Sector of uh, EMEA LATAM from LinkedIn. We have uh, Mr. John Van Vakaitis, who is Director of Google for Education International, joining us online. And we also have on site Mr. Benga Sezan, Executive Director of Paradigm Initiative. So the warmest welcome to all of you. I'm not hearing any applause. I suppose people are applauding, but <laughs> that's fine. We are going to imagine as we go ahead. But uh, with such a distinguished panel and a very mixed perspective and from different part of the world, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So let's go right ahead and uh, start with uh, the structured discussion. We're going to have three main topics and I'm, I mean, and I'm going to ask my panelists to give their thoughts and perspectives under these uh, three different perspectives. Um, each of our panelists will have three minutes maximum to make their interventions and uh, we we'll want to hear as much as possible. And finally, we'll have uh, some concluding remarks if people feel the need to do so. So let's go ahead. And uh, I'm going to ask the first question, which is uh, about policies, because a major current topic of discussion is the need for policies that target early education, including STEM-focused education, to prepare our young people for the future of work and new technologies. So I want to ask all of you coming from public and private sectors and international organizations, how do you think this global need can be addressed? And uh, if I may have the honor to ask our host, our guest from our host country, Poland, Mr. Uh, Murzek, the Secretary of State of the Ministry of Science and Education to please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we are aware of the pace of the changes we are dealing with. <coughs> the changes have been accelerated by the difficult time of the pandemic. We have realized that there are certain areas that are especially sensitive. And I'm referring, for example, to healthcare, but also I'm referring to the economy. In many regions of the world, the economy has suffered a lot due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I think we all realize that on the one hand, we have been working hard for many years to prepare our children, teenagers, and young graduates to be able to cope on the labor market. But on the other hand, we are facing dynamic changes which require us to operate within the constantly changing environment, within an environment that is constantly undergoing change. So that is a huge challenge. And it's a global one as well. We need to create specific mechanisms that will allow us to foresee the direction of change in the development of states and economies. We also need to be able to forecast changes that are necessary in education, and that is something that is essential. 
and it's essential on a global scale. And that's why we need to support good practices and institutions that allow us to tackle these challenges. <laughs> We are aware of the fact that we really need to start early on. And so in Poland, we are implementing the post-pandemic recovery program, which includes an element of digitization. So we intend to strengthen digital education in school or even before that in kindergartens, preschools. So this process is extremely important and it must be continued in primary and secondary schools. So we are trying to prepare specific projects and programs and we need to adjust them to the target group and to specific ages so that children can play and learn to code, for example, to learn to program equipment which might be necessary in the era of Industry 4.0. We are doing that because we are aware of the current challenges. So we can see the new emerging challenges and we are adapting the educational offer, but we are also working on the infrastructure. For example, we want to teach children about technologies that rely on hydrogen, for example. We want to teach them about artificial intelligence to make them understand what it involves. We can see that children enjoy the virtual world, so we want to use that virtual world to teach them about the real world. So, for example, in terms of Industry 4.0, in terms of robots, it's important to teach children how to, for example, write code or design robots. But also we want to teach children to use tools, such as, for example, screwdriver. So we want to keep it real at the same time, because we need to shape specific habits and we need to start very early on. Then we can go on and strengthen those habits and skills. It is a huge challenge to develop skills in order to have competent people who will be able to assess the skills of children and young people. We need people who are able to identify the ch challenges in the labor market, who will be able to identify future challenges that will require specific skills in future. So we want to start working with children to prepare them, to make them ready to make the right choices in the future. So it's not about finding a job, any kind of a job in the labor market. We need to create jobs that will help our societies grow faster and develop faster, but we also want to create jobs that will be rewarding for the people who have them. We want people to have the feeling that they are doing something useful. And we also want to adopt an interdisciplinary approach. We want to teach people how to work in, team, in, in teams, how to see a broader context of the, what they are doing so that they can work together and share the skills that they have. 
So as a state, we are responsible for working with young people, for teaching them to be able to cooperate with others on an international level as well. We want to teach them that we are all facing huge challenges and that forces us to work in teams. There is no other way. You need, we need to cooperate with others. Many things are becoming global right now. So we share similar challenges related to energy, related to climate, and related to other aspects. And so we need to adopt a similar perspective in many countries, and we need to make sure that our education systems teach our children to face up to those challenges. We have learned a lot during the pandemic. We have learned a lot about how technology can support education. And we need to continue working on that. There are many challenges are, that are involved, but we need to make sure that we share best practices, that we share information. There is another important aspect, which is to make sure that science and, science and education is open in terms of the content and in terms of the methods and the technologies that are involved so that we can perceive certain challenges as challenges that we are all facing on a global scale because only then can we use and take advantage of the effect of synergy. And in this way, we will achieve positive results. So these are the aspects that we need to discuss. We also realize that for many states, it is a challenge to highlight science and education and foreground them. We know that it is thanks to science that we have managed to, for example, develop vaccines that allow us to cope with the pandemic. So a lot of progress has been made, but to a large extent, it was possible thanks to pre-existing research foundations. So we need to adopt a global perspective on challenges. And as we can see, we have managed to do just that in the face of a global crisis. The world of science, the world of research looks for answers and offers answers to the most pressing challenges. And I think that events such as this one are a great opportunity to share good practices, to share experience, and to set joint objectives. That's something that is very important for everyone. We are meeting here in Katowice, but we are also present globally thanks to technology. And hopefully this will open our eyes to important problems and we will take stock of what, of what we have, of what we can offer, and so that we can support each other and share best practices. That is the only way that 
will allow us to get positive results in an ever-changing world. We have a lot of challenges to address, and that's why we support many initiatives. We work with young children. We work with children in primary schools, in secondary schools. We work with university students. So we have plenty of programs and projects that are implemented by the state government in Poland. We are active in what we are doing, and we want our solutions to offer a continuous approach to the education process. And we want them to be synergistic. So I suppose uh, that's it on my part as an introductory remark, and I will be interested to listen to the other panelists. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Mertzek, for that very comprehensive uh, uh, answer to the first question. And uh, I have noted uh, a, a few key words such as targeted early, continuous, uh, digital infrastructure, interdisciplinary, international, and open of course. Thank you so much for that great start to the discussion. I would love to introduce the other two guests who have joined us uh, just now. They are Ms. Carmen Ligia Valderrama, who is Minister of Information Technologies and Communications from Colombia. Welcome to the discussion. We have also been joined by Mr. Torsten schäfer Gumbel, who is member of the Management Board of the Agency for International Cooperation, or GIZ from Germany, so they are, they are both joining us online. Without much ado, let me hand over to um, Minister Vaderama for her intervention. Uh, what is being done in Colombia to prepare children uh, from an early age on for the changing dynamics in education? Three minutes, please. Madam, please unmute your microphone, yes. Please, yeah, unmute your microphone. You still muted? We don't hear you yet. Yes, right now, right now. Please go ahead. Um, está encendido. Yes. Escucha? Ya me están now, escuchando en este momento? Now we hear you. Yes. Okay, muy bien. Eh, lo primero sea saludarles muy especialmente. Eh, permíteme decirles que me siento muy honrada de poder participar en este panel sobre este tema tan relevante para todas las naciones. Hoy creo que no hay nación en el planeta Tierra que no esté interesado y dándole toda la prioridad a este asunto, a enfrentar pues desde la política pública los grandes retos de la transformación digital para ponerla al servicio de la gente es nuestra prioridad. De esta manera, pues quisiera compartirles cuál ha sido y cuál está siendo. This uh, afternoon, I'd like to talk about the Colombian experiences so far with respect to digital transformation. We are certain that we need to be an ally for the younger generation with respect to all of the disciplines related to the digital transformation. And so the Colombian government and the ministry that I represent, that is the Ministry of Information Technologies and Communication, well, we have uh, jointly with other ministries reached the conclusion that we need to implement policies and strategies that accelerate digital transformation in order to breach the digital divide that is still observed in Colombia, both with respect to access to digital technologies and the use of digital technologies. So as the Ministry of Information Technologies and Communications, we are the leader of the joint effort 
but the effort has to be interdisciplinary and intersectoral. And so the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Health, and all other ministries are also involved in uh, the work on the transformation policies. Our public policy includes all sorts of digital transformation programs. And I'd like to summarize them as follows. First and foremost, we want to nurture talents. And secondly, we want to promote digital transformation in enterprises. Speaking of education, speaking of nurturing talents that are required throughout the education system, this is a priority for us. We try to stimulate interest in the disciplines that are related to science and STEM subjects. And that uh, helps us encourage students uh, to select science subjects as their study majors. We focus on STEM subjects at the level of primary school and secondary school, making it possible for students to go on and study science at the level of university. On the other hand, in cooperation with enterprises, we also run programs that involve the use of artificial intelligence, blockchain, and so forth, ensuring that these um, advanced technologies are also taught at universities so that university graduates can quickly be adapted to the requirements in the labor market. What is very important is the implementation of the knowledge gained during your studies on the labor market. So be it small enterprises or larger enterprises, there is an enormous need, and not just in Colombia, but across the world, there is a great need to educate people who will have the necessary technical knowledge, who will have um, knowledge on ICT technologies, because these people will support the development of world economies. And so we focus on um, education that centers on the STEM subjects, but we also analyze the needs of the labor market on an ongoing basis. And so our policies are well defined. We want to empower human talents, and we would like to be able to tap into the potential of these new uh, skills for um, the benefit of the society at large. And so both in the sector of industry as well as in the sector of agriculture, we want to ensure that university graduates will support the development of the two sectors. And we have already observed a lot of success in that respect. We believe that the state, in realizing the need for educating um, uh, people in scientific disciplines, needs to create the necessary conditions. Thank you, Madame, for that uh, very brief but uh, very focused intervention. I understand that Colombia see a great need in the transformation of education towards the digital era, and you emphasize very much the role of enterprises, both in providing the education and in helping training young talents, and this education is extremely well defined according to the need of the labor market. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Colombian perspective. Next, let's hear from some international organizations. What do they think can be done to meet the need, the global need for young talents for the digital age? Let me go to Ms. Ranalia Abdul Rahim, Senior Vice President of Strategy, Communications and Engagement from Internet Society. Please, Ms. Rahim, your team. 
Thank you, Ms. Liu. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be here today. So here's my view on the question that you posed. It would be in the best interest of every country to have national policies that target early education, to prepare young people for the future of work and new technologies. What's important is to ensure that the policies are inclusive, that they foster access to learning resources for disadvantaged groups, such as those living in rural areas or in poverty, ethnic minorities, speakers of minority languages, and those with disabilities. This includes having effective mechanisms for addressing gender inequalities in education and for improving opportunities and outcomes for girls, particularly in STEM education. But education policies alone won't be sufficient. They need supportive access and connectivity policies in place to be effective. Over the years, the internet has proven to be instrumental for learning and development of people and nations. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us just how much we depend on the internet and its resilience, an attribute of its distributed governance model. The lesson of the pandemic as people are forced to stay at home is plain and clear. No internet means no access to remote education, work or health services. Socioeconomic growth and potential for many countries have been damaged. As we move towards a future that is more technologically driven with emphasis on blended learning, the world's internet and digital dependency will only increase. But benefits accrue mainly to those that are connected. This inequality is the challenge that societies around the world are grappling with today. We all know that nearly half the world's population are still offline. The majority of them are women and most in developing countries. If they are left unconnected, what is the future of education and work for them and their children? Universal access is needed to unlock the internet's value for supporting education and national development of the future. To get to universal access, access to the internet needs to be affordable for people. Access to broadband internet in particular is key if benefits for education and development are to be reaped. Here are five things that are needed to enable access based on lessons learned from countries around the world. First, a governmental commitment to keeping the internet on and not to shut it down. Internet shutdowns are costly with adverse social and economic effects. Second, a legal and regulatory framework that stimulates investment in connectivity, that spurs competition and lowers access prices. Third, flexible and innovative funding approaches. And this includes effective deployment of universal access funds and service programs. Fourth, national broadband strategies and universal access programs that include the participation of educational institutions and national research and education networks. And finally, diverse models for access and use, including community-based access initiatives, such as community networks, educational networks, and local R&D initiatives that generate these diverse models. I conclude by emphasizing that successful approaches to meeting the educational needs of the future require a serious and equal focus on both education and access policies. Thank you, and back to you, Ms. Liu. Thank you so much, Renalia. Uh, exactly as I was researching for this topic, I was almost shocked to learn that uh, almost half of the world are still digitally offline. That's according to the statistics from the United Nations. And most of that is uh, for women and for developing countries. So you have highlighted a very important uh, aspect that need to be addressed. Many thanks to Ranalia. Next, let's go to Mr. Luke McKent, Head of Growth Markets and Head of Government Sector from uh, EMEA and LATAM regions from LinkedIn. Mr. McKent, please go ahead. Hi, and uh, thank you very much for having me on the panel. Um, it, it, it's hard to argue with anything that any of the uh, panelists have already, have already mentioned. I just perhaps want to add a few, a few additional comments. I think the, the primary question from my perspective would be, what kind of future are we actually preparing our, our youth for? Um, if we believe that the only future that we're preparing them for is a technological future, um, I suspect that we're probably missing the trick. Yes, of course, STEM, style, uh, STEM, uh, STEM education is incredibly important 
and the ongoing digitalization of our economies is something that you know will, will be continuing for, for for decades to come but there are a couple of other things that we need to take into account that um, i think are incredibly important one of which is the the softer skills that will be con continue to be needed to be developed um, in order for us to make full use of all of the digital talent that we have uh, in our economies. And uh, what, 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 what could those look like? Uh, I think we're, we're looking at how do we collaborate effectively? How do we teach collaboration? How do, we teach, how do we teach problem solving? How do we develop the kind of foundational skills that enable uh, the children of today to become the adults of the future that love lifelong learning because that is probably the primary skill that all of us are going to have to adopt in order to be consistently relevant throughout our careers. One of the biggest challenges that I think, uh, never mind governments, but any private sector organization has at the moment, is keeping up with the pace of change and the, the changing needs of the skill sets of our employees uh, from a day-to-day -day basis. If I think about when I started my career, uh, a short, uh, maybe 25 years ago, many of the job titles that now exist within the organization that I currently work for did not exist. In fact, many of those job titles didn't exist 10 years ago. So how do we develop educational systems that are flexible and adaptable enough to cope with a labor market that is changing so quickly? That is, that is the primary challenge that we have. And that is why it's, it's very hard to focus on a narrow set of skills that may, way, may well be technological in nature without also focusing on the skills that enable us to adapt and develop over time. So I, I would suggest those are some of the things that we really need to think very carefully about. Um, I also feel very strongly that uh, we, we have a couple of other challenges that are that almost uh, uh, pre-learning, so to speak. And the previous speaker alluded very, very much to those, and, and that is the problem of access. Um, and it's much of the educational challenges that we're talking about are predicated on people's access and, and youth access to the internet. That, that is a fantastic solution to a problem if you're in a mature internet economy. But that's not a great solution to the problem when you're in Africa or when you're anywhere else where internet penetration falls well below the kind of penetration that we see in mature internet economies. And there are huge issues of access relating to the kind of devices that people use, the, the price of internet, infrastructural issues. Uh, and not only that, what is the content that people consume? Is it localized? Is it local language? There are a variety of challenges that we need to address to make sure that everyone globally has equal access to the kind of educational opportunities that we enjoy in mature internet economies. So I would just raise those as a few of the additional challenges that we might face. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McKent. Absolutely uh, essential questions you have asked. Actually, sometimes I feel the more digitally advanced we are, the more we need to think about the important questions about life, about humanities, right? about sociology. How do our mind work? How do we get peace in this digital age? But uh, thank you so much for raising these questions. I hope we'll have some answers as we move along and you know, as, uh, as we leave this panel. Uh, next, let me go to Mr. John Van Vakaitis, he's Director of Google for Education International. Very much looking forward to your, your intervention on how to meet the global need for early education that prepare our young people for the future of work. We don't hear you, sir. So we don't hear you. Hello. Yes, now we hear you. Yes. Sorry. Uh, great points made by the panelists. Thanks for, for uh, introducing me, Lucian. Uh, I think it, uh, I'll make a couple of macro points and then we'll get into some more detail and hopefully everyone can still hear me. Am I being heard? Because I hear you holding your mic. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, great. Uh, at Google, we've been focused on supporting and enriching education with digital tools and the past couple of years have only served uh, to reinforce the importance of this, right? And I wanted to highlight three macro level points that I think are, are probably very obvious for everybody, but worth repeating, and then get into some detailed thoughts around STEM and, and around higher policy or greater policy. Um, one is the way we work has changed. It's very clear. You can see how we're participating today, right? Millions around the world 
have turned their homes into virtual offices uh, due to the pandemic and technology is essential to stay connected uh, with our day-to-day -day work. And this is the same in education as well, right? And it's impacted not only labor, but education. It needs to impact an education policy and labor policy. Um, and as we've seen over the past two years, uh, it, it, was, it was a growing trend, but it's really obviously accelerated is the use of education technology has really skyrocketed in schools. Schools have been searching for solutions to keep students engaged and learning. And as most students return uh, to classrooms and others continue to learn from home because we have different situations in different countries, we continue to be very optimistic about the positive role that education technology will play in helping teachers and school leaders in the years ahead. And ultimately the goal of, of technology in education is to augment and amplify the critical work undertaken by educators. And I think that's the most important thing. Technology is a tool for us, it's not a panacea. I think digital skills clearly are increasingly needed in the ever evolving employment landscape. Um, we're not able to predict, I think uh, some of the points made, and I think Luke mentioned this as well, as, as well as Renali is, and you mentioned it yourself in your, in your opening, is flexibility. You mentioned the term flexibility, and I think we have to maintain flexibility. We don't know what the answers are going to be. We don't know what new professions are going to arise in the coming years. We have to prepare children by teaching them how to use digital tools and develop deeper literacies and understanding of those tools. That's one component, right? But they also obviously need to have a flexible approach to learning and a desire to learn. It's very, very important. We have to make learning inclusive and exciting and inter interactive. It's very, very important to do this, how you keep people engaged. And this is not just for STEM. It's essential in many, many other areas, right? Um, again, technology is a tool. It's a tool just like we're using pen, paper, and books, right? It's just the next generation of, of tools for us. Uh, it's very, very important. I think one of the other speakers talked about government level policies and programs that support clear mechanisms to nurture transformation at all levels. So you need to have access to the internet. You need to have an open approach to using technology in the classroom. This is gonna form the basis for employment, right? It's very, very important for us. I think STEM is an important part of this. STEM is not the whole piece of it, but let's be honest, there are a, a great movement in job employment opportunities into STEM-based roles. And so any, any government would wanna consider what's their position in building skills in this area to prepare uh, students to be the next level of employed uh, adults in the workforce and, and what they're needed. There was a report just released by the Brookings Institute entitled Building Skills for Life. It's a, it's a, a report that we co-sponsored uh, talking about how to expand and improve computer science education around the world. And I think it's a, it's a great tool for me to take a look at and to read. Um, it provides case studies of larger scale implementations of computer science informal education as well. But I would say that beyond STEM, there are some fundamental elements that are really strong indicator success in education. Again, I'm approaching this from an education perspective. One is the public entity has to be willing and able to invest in the necessary infrastructure to make computing education possible. And I think one of our other speakers touched on this. Um, the entity has, uh, has to be engaged in partnerships with stakeholders including teacher groups, parents, and industry. And it has to be focused on upskilling current teachers. And this is really important, upskilling current teachers and creating a healthy pipeline of future teachers. So working with teacher colleges as well, who can address uh, the needs, the coming needs, right? So the use of technology is not going to slow and it poses a learning curve uh, for all of us and, and an opportunity as well. So it's for students, it's for teachers, it's for all of us working, right? Uh, we have worked very, very hard on, um, on creating certification programs for teachers as well in the use of technology in their classrooms. So a large component of our efforts in global education have been devoted to helping teachers develop comfort and competency using technology in the classroom to support their learning plans. It's a very, very important element. That investment in teachers needs to be a policy initiative in all governments. It's one that certainly we've been supporting through a lot of our investments and in our efforts in education. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, John. Again, a very different perspective from the use of educational technologies and flexibility 
not just in the content of uh, what is being taught, but also in the approach of how these are being taught. And last but definitely not least, what are we going to do with the, the teachers? How do we upscale the teachers who will be teaching the young talents? Again, very essential questions there. Many thanks to John again. And uh, still on the same important question, let me go to Executive Director of Paradigm Initiative, Mr. Benga Cezanne who is joining us on site. I understand this is uh, a grouping for uh, helping underprivileged youth in Africa where digital access is not particularly strong. So, sir, help us understand your perspective on the question. Thank you. You know, if COVID has so far taught us anything, it's the fact that there are two kinds of young people. Uh, there's, on one hand, the young person who is taking advantage of technology opportunities. Now they are learning more things than they used to learn in the classroom physically. Uh, but they're also picking up skills uh, around independence and other soft skills. And on the other hand, this is a second category of young people who not only are not learning, but are also forgetting the things that they learned. When schools were closed uh, in March 2020, uh, what we found at the Paradigm Initiative was that there, were, there was a whole group of young people who not only forgot what they had learned, but were literally getting into a second level of digital divide. So we already had a digital divide where about 40% of the world is not connected. Now we have a second level divide where not only are they unconnected or disconnected, but they're also almost in a whole different world entirely where they don't have access to, you know, to information and to learning. And I think this is why you know, any form of policies that we would discuss must take two things you know, uh, into consideration. First is the reality of the current moment. It's very you know, great to think of tech uh, when we're considering policies. And I've seen many government policies across many countries where we work, uh, where their policies are completely disconnected from their realities, uh, where governments talk about learning online, uh, but the students absolutely have no access to computers. We had a scenario in one of the countries where the government then said before you, you know, you have to write your exit examination from secondary school online. It has to be a computer-based test, but by the final year, almost all of the students had not even seen a computer. So a few weeks before the exams, they had to go to a public cafe. They had to go to public cafes to go and learn how to use a computer for the first time and then to write exams using computers in a few weeks. So we have that challenge of the unconnected 40% that we must consider when we're developing policies. The second is that while it's very convenient to try to do what everyone else does in terms of you know, fourth industrial revolution, STEM, and all of that, policies must be grounded in the reality of national socioeconomic plans. And I say this because in many scenarios, universities across many of the countries that we work produce graduates who literally are not fit to work in the countries. Uh, so many of them end up picking up skills that only make them relevant when they emigrate, when they leave the countries. We need a handshake between industry in that specific country and the academia. What are the needs? You know, I had a chance to ask you know, one of the government institutions in, in Nigeria this question last week. What skills? does Nigeria need in the next 10 years? Now, those skills should then determine what the curriculum should be in universities. We can't disconnect industry need on the ground from you know, uh, the curriculum. And, and the last thing I'd, I'd like to say is that many of the solutions to the problem we have exist in many civil society and even private sector projects. And I think it's high time that many governments you know, took advantage of these projects as scaling opportunities. See those projects that have been done across the global south as an opportunity, you know, as a test of many of the solutions we're looking for, and then we can, you know, we can then scale those solutions. Many of those projects, you know, that are done by Paradigm Initiative and others uh, are able to reach just a few millions. But imagine if policy is able to shake hands with many of the sample projects that have delivered results, we can then see that scale uh, on a very, very large scale. And I'll pause here for now. Thank you so much, Mr. Cezanne. Uh, I think uh, you have highlighted once again the, the reality that COVID-19 has brought the digital divide front and central to us. Uh, 
almost wherever we are, actually, this problem is not just in Africa, in the underdeveloped South, even in developed countries. I tell you, in Switzerland, for instance, when everybody was caught up in the pandemic, even the teachers were complaining about not having the computer to work on, you know, to, to help the children learn and, and submit home, home uh, assignments and stuff. So this is really a, a global problem. And in a way, COVID-19 uh, shook us to the, the grim reality. But uh, great perspectives you have mentioned, absolutely essential there as well. So we have come to... The, um, the, 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 the end of the first question in our structured um, discussion, and we're going to move on to actually one step further to how to facilitate exactly, and this is one of the things that we, many of the speakers have talked about, how, how governments um, adopt an approach that facilitates the adoption and use of new technologies in general. So not just for students, not just for teachers, but for all members of society. How can we ensure that all citizens acquire the necessary skills to face new technological developments? Let's not forget the elderly population, for instance, the disadvantaged in an aging society such as China, for instance, this is a great challenge. And uh, without much ado, let me give the floor to Ms. Uh, Carmen Lehia Varaderama once again for her intervention. Madam, the mic is yours, please. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Um, yo quiero decirles que coincido con eh, mis antecesores eh, y voy a conectar sus intervenciones con la pregunta que acaban de decir. Yo creo que aquí no podemos obviar, por lo menos desde Colombia, en nuestras condiciones, los tres grandes derroteros que debemos de tener presente. No solamente trabajar en la conectividad, en lograr que se llegue con la conexión a todo el territorio nacional, sino que debemos de generar la implementación de esas herramientas que les permitan usar esa conectividad a todo nivel. Estamos de acuerdo, inclusive en personas adultas y adultas mayores que hoy por hoy también han necesitado ya eh, aprender de las nuevas tecnologías. Y por supuesto, el tercer eh, derrotero que estamos trabajando aquí en Colombia es el de la apropiación, en que realmente la tecnología se convierta no solamente en, en un instrumento que les facilite la vida cotidiana a los colombianos, sino que les permita desarrollar y potencializar mucho más cada una de sus actividades. Y en este punto entonces quiero eh, compartirles cómo las políticas públicas de, de esa apropiación digital que tenemos en Colombia están diseñadas entendiendo todas esas necesidades específicas de cada una de las poblaciones a las que queremos impactar. De hecho, tenemos eh, muchos eh, proyectos que van dirigidos dependiendo el foco social en el que, con el que estamos trabajando. Mujeres, niños, jóvenes, emprendedores, inclusive hay un proyecto que yo resalto muy especialmente que es el de trabajo con mujeres no escolarizadas de entrada pareciera un poco exótico porque pensar en enseñar tecnología a quienes no tienen un nivel de escolaridad parece contradictorio, pero lo cierto es que la tecnología se ha vuelto en un lenguaje, en un lenguaje que al contrario lo que hace es conectar la realidad con la posibilidad de desarrollar sobre todo sus emprendimientos Ok, madame Okay, Madam Minister, I'm so sorry to, yeah, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I have just been told I have three minutes left, so I do want to, but we got the gist of your intervention. I, and I do have one more question. So I'm going to go straight to the last question. Uh, how would you define equitable employment conditions and where do you see major leverages for change? Uh, if I may, uh, let me give the, the opportunity to Mr. Torten Schäfer Gumbel from GIZ Germany. If you could, in two minutes, please sum up your answer, sir. I'm so sorry about this. Yeah, time is really limited. I was told five minutes left. Herzlichen Dank für die Einladung. Auf der einen Seite bietet digitale Arbeit neue und flexible Beschäftigungsformen. Das digitale Outsourcing und Offshoring kann in erheblichen Umfang Arbeitsplätze schaffen und auch im Bereich des digitalen Unternehmentums äh, bieten sich viele Optionen für Entwicklungsländer, sowohl auf der lokalen als auch auf den internationalen Märkten. Und der Rahmen von IKT-basierten Dienstleistungen 
Mit der Schaffung geeigneter Rahmenbedingungen und gezielten Fördermaßnahmen kann so die Digitalisierung ganz sicher eine wichtige Rolle bei der Beschäftigungsförderung in unseren Partnerländern spielen. Auf der anderen Seite bringen diese Entwicklungen aber auch bestimmte Herausforderungen mit sich. Die GEZ unterstützt seit 2017 das Fair Work Foundation, die sich für Transparenz und faire Arbeit in der Ökonomie einsetzt. Sie hat gemeinsam mit der ILO fünf Kriterien faire Arbeit entwickelt, die als Grundlage für die Bewertung von Arbeitsbedingungen auf digitalen Plattformen dienen. Und das will ich am Ende einfach noch mal unterstreichen. Diese sind faire Bezahlung, faire Verträge, faire Bedingungen, faire Managementprozesse und faire Mitbestimmung. Und da will ich einfach einen Punkt machen. Thank you so much, sir. I haven't been able to get the uh, translation on, but I'm sure our organizers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I'm, but I'm sure the organizers will put out the uh, translation of your intervention um, somehow digitally. But uh, thank you so much. And I'm really sorry about the very limited time you've had. You tried very, very much to join us. Um, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I really have to leave it there. Um, this is the thing with this digital forum, right? You're not like when you have a physical gathering, you can just uh, go on a little bit. That's the reality. We all have to adapt. But I'm sure we all walk away with uh, many new ideas and inspirations. So a warm round of applause, whoever you are, wherever you can, to all our panelists. And uh, indeed, I have learned a great deal. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to host this panel as well. I hope we do have this discussion in the near future. Thank you very much. It's bye bye from Beijing. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. I'm sorry about the time. Yeah.